So our agenda today, um, we're going to do, I'm going to do some front mat, what I call front matter stuff, and uh, we'll do some introductions with the group. Um, please be prepared to uh, turn on your mic at some point and introduce yourself, um, because we're going to do that. I'm going to do a quick overview of just the principles of the incident command system. Um, and we're going to spend the bulk of our time doing something called coordination review um, in the incident command system. More about that later. Um, there's a, a, a good way of making sure that all the information is captured and all of the coordination that needs to happen um, in uh, the chaos of a disaster response happening. Um, gets done and we're going to go through and work as a group and talk about that um, kind of look at what it is in the in the formal system and then how we're actually applying that in our nonprofit because it will look a little different. Uh, we're not firefighters, which is a good thing. Um, and then we'll have a little uh, scenario sort of thing. We'll break up into into we'll go into some breakout rooms so we can actually talk together. Um, in, in a group and look at what we did for the storms back in January in our organization and then see how we can take the lessons out of that for applying for, it turns out, this weekend. Um, turns out that was very timely. Um, and then we'll wrap up. We'll talk about some future trainings um, that you and your organization can attend um, that we're offering also through the UASI funding and I have an evaluation that we'll put into the chat. If you guys could do that, I really appreciate it. Um, those evaluations and my ability to you know, give them the metrics back is um, how we're able to be in our fifth year um, doing these trainings. Uh, next slide, please. Um, housekeeping. Um, again, take care of yourself as you need to. We're all grownups and a lot of us are in our own house. Um, if you can, if you sign in in the chat, I know Anna did mention this earlier. Usually what I do is if, is I let people know um, if you want to share your information with other people in the group, if you put that information in the chat, I will share the information that is in the chat with others. Um, she already said had people just kind of do that as a check-in. So if you could let me know if you want to actually share your information with the rest of the group or not. Um, I tend to defer on the not sharing people's information. That's just, you know, kind of my personal preference. Um, emergency exits, uh, just a reminder, even though we are not together in a room, uh, you should know where the emergency exit is for where you are now. Um, I personally can't see, I have a little blurred background, but I have a door right next to me. I can go and hop over the, hop right over the railing and perhaps break a leg on the concrete down there, but um, know where your emergency exit is all the time. It's good disaster preparedness um, and just general safety. And then again, at the end, I will um, ask you for an evaluation. Uh, next slide, please. This is me. Hi, I'm Heather. Um, I've been with my organization, which I'll tell you about in a second, since 2019. Um, I consider myself to be a disaster nerd. Um, I became a Red Cross volunteer in 2012 and um, led a whole, like, worked my way up through the ranks and then was an incident commander um, and led Red Cross disaster responses for a few years. Um, including I did some work um, with Hurricane Harvey in Dallas. Um, I led the Red Cross response for the ghost ship fire that was in Oakland several years back. Um, I, my very first, you know, real, you know, a disaster, you know, natural disaster response was actually the floods in Redwood City. I want to say 2014, but it might have been 13, actually. Um, the years blur, um, but so my first my first real response was actually here in San Mateo County, um, and so I'm associate business continuity professional. I used to be a minister in the Episcopal Church, so um, wide variety of things, and I've got about twenty years of volunteer management under my belt. Um, so I tend to come at things with the assumption that everybody, of course, wants to volunteer. Um, although I do know that that is not actually true. <laughs> um, so next slide. 
Um, my organization, San Francisco Community Agencies Responding to Disaster, it's a bit of a legacy name. We actually work in uh, the larger Bay Area and up into Northern California as well. And these trainings, any trainings that I do that are online are open to anyone. And so I've had, I get people from the East Coast quite often. I have had someone from Mexico City attend. So I have even done trainings internationally, so to speak. Um, this organization has been around for a while. Uh, CARDS were the original VOADs, which are merging into COADs. And we'll talk a little bit more about those terms if you don't know them. And then this particular one is called RISE. So um, I hope that you will all laugh with me when I mention the fact that one of those principles in the incident command system is everybody should use the same terminology so that it's clear to everyone involved what's going on and who they're talking to. Doesn't happen to anybody. It doesn't happen to nonprofits. It doesn't happen in government. Nobody's doing it. Um, but, but the idea is very nice. <laughs> so next slide. I'm required to tell you a little bit about my funder, the Urban Area Security Initiative. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it's FEMA is under Homeland Security, um, just so you know where it is located in the larger government structure. And um, this funding started um, after 9 11, um, but then, you know, as FEMA came in, and so it's, you know, all around um preparing the whole region for um terrorist attacks and catastrophic disasters so um i'm really grateful like i said we have been receiving these funds for about five years and finally at the national level they have realized that working with our nonprofit um community-based faith-based organizations um, is an important part of our disaster response and we should be uh, training them, teaching them, and supporting them appropriately. So finally, these, the use of these funds is guaranteed at the national level, even though our local UWASI has been doing it, like I said, for the last five years. Um, the next slide. Next slide. There. I'm going to turn this over to Anna for a second, um, okay. because she knows more about this organization than I do. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Miskolta. I am the Director of Community Resilience at Thrive Alliance, and I lead Thrive Rise, which is a special initiative of Thrive. So as Heather mentioned on the last couple of slides, um, we are actually a COAD, so Community Organizations Active in Disaster. The 10 second definition of that is a network of multi-sector organizations that get together and communicate and you know, collaborate to respond to community needs when we have emergencies. Um, and Thrive um, has spent the last, you know, year and a half or plus um, uh, preparing to launch Thrive Rise um, for when I came on board last September. Um, and it is a really great organization to be hosting a co-ad in because Thrive is already a convener of nonprofits. Uh, we have a really large network uh, of both nonprofits and government partners. So it was a natural fit to do a, an initiative like this. So, um, you know, we're about five months old. Thrive Rise is about five months old now. And we've already had our first you know, significant um, couple of events, actually, not just the storms, but but some some other events as well. So we've certainly hit the ground running and um, we are setting up, we're trying to organize a, a training series this year in collaboration with SF Card and, and some other regional partners. And this is the, the first uh, official training that is not related to, you know, emergencies, uh, the winter storms. Um, I should rephrase that. This is the first planned training that um, we did not have to um, uh, basically launch last minute as a result of people not understanding FEMA assistance. So um, welcome to the series. <laughs> and I hope we all get something out of this today. I think we have some really great content coming up. Uh, the next slide, and then I'm going to let Anna um, call on people um, to uh, introduce themselves. All right, so we just want to see who's in the room. We did some we did um, some uh, introductions in the chat, but I would really like to people to come off mute and just you know tell us your name and organization again, but also 
what do you do and what what's your day to day um you know scope of services and how does that change when we have something like an atmospheric river or three coming into our region um cuz that really is what something like a coad is about and something like these trainings are about we want to understand your organizational shift when emergencies happen um so Jennifer, can I pick on you to go first? Of course, Anna, no problem. Uh, yes, Jennifer Adams, I um, am the Environmental Justice Program Coordinator at Nuestra Casa. Um, as a whole, our organization really focuses on um, centering our community voices and uplifting them. I, I personally work on envir our Environmental Justice um, Program Academy that educates our community about the issues regarding environmental justice um, locally and um, amplifying their voices, um, activating them to really push for change in their community. And um, right now what we're doing uh, that we're kind of changing in a disaster is that we're, we're hearing communities' voices and their concerns right now around the FEMA assistance and more lack of the follow-up on after applying. And so with the help of Thrive, we've really shifted within a week to provide our community um, like a workshop to actually be able to assist them through the FEMA application and, and to let them know that they can appeal a, a denial on an application, which a lot of community members weren't aware of. Um, and these are frontline communities, so they're more greatly affected by these floods and um, makes it a lot harder for them to just easily replace their, their belongings. And so, um, you know, we're really thankful to have partners like Thrive that can, you know, help us, <laughs> support us in, in turning that around and making something like that happen. Um, so that's why we're also here too, right? We want to know what we can continue to do in the future so that it's not a last minute like okay this is what the community is telling us what can we do but like be proactive and set up goal, uh, roles and implementation within our own organization to make sure that we have we give ourselves and our community plenty of time when a disaster happens that we're not you know trying to get something together um last minute before like deadlines um you know before the deadlines end and then the community it wasn't aware of those things so that's a little bit of what we do Thanks, Jennifer. And that's such a great example, too. Um, Tara, would you like to go next? Hi. Sure. Hello. Um, so I am from Art Bias, and we support artists. We offer 50 artist studios and professional development mentorships and um, some other programming. Um, we rent our building, and you know we've never really had an emergency plan. And I will say um, what, how do, you know, your question, how does that change in a disaster? We don't really know. We don't have a plan. Um, we just finished this week, we're finishing the repairs from the New Year's Eve floods. And, you know, we only have two part-time staff. So we're just learning about all of this. And, um, I think, I don't know how everyone else is, but as a renter, we don't really have um, a lot of, it's almost like the landlord has all of the responsibility, even though we have the responsibility to our artists. So it gets a little bit confusing on whose responsibility. Um, and it, yeah, it was difficult with the last disaster. Thanks for sharing, Tara. I think this and some of the follow-up trainings will be really useful for Art Bias. Thank you. Great. T, uh, Dean from CID. Hi, everybody. Um, glad to be here. Um, very happy that uh, Thrive is sponsoring uh, such a such an awesome event. Uh, so comprehensive. Yeah, I'm pretty involved on and off with CFILC and um, have been involved with DDAR responses on uh, several weekends. Uh, and some weekdays uh, as needed. And uh, I'm not uh, a disaster coordinator, but uh, I'm a community health coordinator and basically uh, in, char in, ch in charge with um, my uh, with Nick, uh, my partner in creating a new department within the organization, uh, dealing specifically with community health. However, um, uh, me and Nick have both been pulled in with the DDAR. Uh, we both have emergency management backgrounds. Uh, I was a officer with Homeland Security and he, is, he was in the military. And uh, we've both done things related to uh, such. So we're assisting um, with the CID effort to help San Mateo County. Um, 
Yeah, so really happy to be here, partnered with Thrive, Umoja, and several other organizations in the area. Um, glad to be here. Thanks, Dean. Oh, you're welcome. Hi. Dale, would you like to go next? Hi, I'm Dale Miller uh, from the North Fair Oaks Community Alliance. And coincidentally, we just rolled out our BAT program, Block Action Team uh, program that we've been working on. We worked on some uh, several months with the Office of Community Affairs through the county uh, to create some training content. Um, mostly the program is, is uh, um, uh, designed like other community response uh, team and BAT team uh, programs across the Bay Area and around the world. Uh, my day job is uh, I work at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. I'm on the uh, Slack emergency response team there. I've been on that for about 25 years. So uh, I'm well trained. I have CPR training, um, all kinds of interesting uh, on uh, hands-on training, cribbing, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so we're excited. Uh, what happens? Uh, we're trying to get our our uh, that team organized. Like I said, just rolled out uh, this week. So, um, but uh, we often go out. Uh, what was it last year? We had a lot of flooding, uh, clogged storm drains, stuff like that. So a few of us went out with trucks and uh, uh, cleaned out storm drains, tried to do what we could, pick up trash that was floating around. Um, we have uh, hosted a couple of meetings and we gave out DYI air filters uh, in response to the fire, uh, wildfire smoke. Uh, so we had a couple of guys from Stanford that had some funding for uh, uh, basically a fan and a HEPA filter, and you uh, strap them together. And it's, it's termed a, a Beijing a HEPA filter because they've been using these. Uh, uh, you know, basically anything you can find to strap on a fan to filter the air is better than nothing. So. Um, we gave away, I think, 40 of these units. Um, and uh, another Stanford student is working on clean air centers. So everybody's heard about like uh, during heat events, there's uh, places where seniors and others can go to stay cool in a heat event. Uh, they're working on it. And I think that there was some funding and some county organizations did get uh, well, at least they're planning on um, installing certain filters uh, in their facilities so that in the future uh, they can provide uh, clean air centers. Um, uh, we responded to the pandemic uh, years ago and uh, had a local seamstress um, make a, a face mask, very high quality face mask uh, in a time when uh, face masks were not even available uh, to the general public. And so uh, we put somebody who was out of work uh, to work. This was some funding from uh, via Facebook, but also I think we use funding from the Silicon Valley um, Foundation. So we're a very small organization and we pride ourselves on being able to react to things uh, pretty much instantaneously because we don't have a big a board to go through or that type of thing. So, um, and we're very local. North Fair Oaks is a small community. Uh, census says it's only about 15,000, but uh, uh, actually it's probably uh, closer to 25,000. A lot of undocumented uh, workers. And, um, anyways, that's it from uh, that's, that's it for me. Thank you, Dale. Um, can we hear from Wendy? Hey, good morning. This is Wendy from Casa Circulo Cultural. We are an, a small nonprofit organization located in North Fairfax um, area. Uh, we also been working during the pandemic and you know giving information to our community. Um, we have our center right there in Meadowfield Road, um, where the uh, parking lot with the mural is. So people know that 
uh, they can come to the organization uh, and then they can rely for information and resources. Uh, we've been working with the community for almost 14 years um, that we have been in business. During the pandemic, we were uh, doing uh, COVID tests, do, giving you know um, tests uh, for the community too, giving information. We did a flu vaccination clinic. So, and we have our, our texting uh, text uh, text uh, program where we can send uh, to all our contacts all the information uh, pertinent um, about when it's a you know when there was the flow, um, when they can have resources and, and all that kind of stuff. So thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, Gabby? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. I'm always checking this headset here. But um, my name is Gabby Fuller with United Ways of California, and I'm the 211 program coordinator. Uh, I assist with 211 Bay Area as a database curator and um, a resource specialist, a community resource specialist. So, um, you know, I do presentations, outreach events, um, database curating uh, for five years now with United Way, uh, United Way Bay Area, and then for four years with California. So uh, during disasters, um, you know, we, Actually, before the disaster hits, um, we share out um, resources to the community around warming centers, uh, where to pick up sandbags. Um, so we have like a, a pre-disaster set of resources. And then we have during the disaster, if there's um, any flood advisories or evacuations or street outreach programs that will you know, reach people. Um, during an emergency. Um, and uh, then we also have resources during the recovery phase. So um, something like, you know, post-disaster damage reporting, or if there are programs for disaster loans, um, those all get in the database. So, um, you know, we are AIRS certified. Um, AIRS is the uh, credentialing organization. So, um, you know, we have to be flexible to where um, our callers are calling 24 seven and, um, you know, they can call in any language. So we have over 200 um, different languages if we needed to. And um, uh, yeah, that's what I'll share now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gabby. Um, Rosa? Hi, um, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Rosa Nelson and I'm the Water Justice Coordinator with West Casa. Um, mostly to echo off of Jennifer, to be honest, I don't really work in disaster coordination up until the storms. And then we realized there was like a pretty big need. So I think right now we're also trying to just figure out like internal protocol for how we should respond um, and how I know that getting food into the hands of community members very quickly after disaster that's shelf stable is something that we're really working on. But I have to be honest that I'm mostly here to like learn and like learn more about protocol and how to get set up because I know that we need to, but um, it wasn't really at the forefront of our minds until this this winter. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, yeah, I think this is a very timely training, unfortunately. Um, Paul, would you like to go next? Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Cruz. I am the program manager um, of the Center for Independence of Individuals with Disabilities here in San Mateo. We serve um, older adults we, and individuals with disabilities, and we provide individualized supportive services, everything from housing, um, caregiving support, assistance with um, state benefits. Um, but I'm here on behalf of uh, what Dean, my colleague, alluded to. Uh, which is our Disability Disaster Access and Resources Program. Um, this program at CID launched in 2020, and it really was just a dip, a toe dip into the pool of emergency response and disaster preparedness. And it, it started as just focusing on supporting older adults and individuals with disabilities who rely on medical equipment to help uh, them 
stay at home or at least um, manage uh, uh, situations during the warm, you know, high fire risk um, seasons um, when power outages become prevalent. Um, we have a grant through um, the California Foundation of Independent Living Centers, who's also then contracted um, by pg e to provide backup battery resources. Um, however, you, uh, since 2020, our program has evolved and continued to evolve. Um, one thing that um, uh, that's become impactful for us here in 2023 is that our DDAR program has been been tapped by pg e through to support communities, not just in the high fire risk areas, uh, which in San Mateo County typically is the Northern Santa Cruz mountains, but now we're extending our support and providing resources to communities along the peninsula, you know, the Northern counties here in San Mateo. Um, so we're currently in this program redesign phase. And I think having uh, the RISE initiative is very timely for us, uh, for us as a team to understand where an organization like CID can fit in events like these uh, set of storms that we've had since January. Um, uh, you know, Dean, had, because of his experience and and his, um, our other colleague, Nicholas, because of our experience, we're trying to like cobble together a makeshift response team. And, and honestly, it's it's the, an issue of as an organ as a um, nonprofit organization, we have to balance the the we have to toe that line of our roles uh, of being a responder or a resource, and that's that's been the most difficult part for us. I'm very grateful to be part of this training series. It's going to be something that we'll learn. Um, we are also without an active DDAR coordinator, and so that's something that um, you know having. Uh, Dean Nicholas and myself in these meetings will help us prepare. So when we uh, bring in that new coordinator, who will be heading up that program. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Seth, could we hear from you? Sure, I'm Seth Azen. I'm the Chief Business Officer at the Peninsula Jewish Community Center in Foster City. Uh, we are a 12-acre um, campus with uh, a preschool and a day school on our campus as well. Um, and, um, yeah, we like to view ourselves or think of ourselves as a, as a resource for the Foster City community and, and the broader community around Foster City and in instances of disasters. And, um, yeah, so that's why I'm here. Thanks for joining us, Seth. Uh, Rick? I am Rick Reed, a longtime emergency management volunteer here in San Mateo County until just recently. Um, was a crisis manager for Intel Corporation. Uh, Anna, would you like to go next? Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Lee Moraz from uh, Casa Circulo Cultural, like Wendy and Peninsula 360 Press. Um, as Wendy already uh, stated, I'm going to focus more on Peninsula 360 Press. We have an experience of we're both uh, like co-partner um, and I are both sociologists. We have a previous experience with the earthquake in Mexico on the 19th of September 2017, um, where we really asked ourselves what what we what could we do as community leaders and what could we do as sociologists in the affected areas? And um, so we went to this community, um, I'll connect it with here in a minute, <laughs> uh, with th this community and really connected with the people and asked how we could help and what they needed. Um, they really needed um, help with the kids because they were particularly vulnerable um their school fell you know it was um it was it was bad so we we started um workshops and um through those workshops we were able to send aid um to to um we did um we did it we did murals and we did um we did an ex exhibit uh 
through photo photo voice and with the murals and with the photo voice exhibit we created a, a web page that actually helped us to um to locate resources from the barrier area to the areas that were affected these uh workshops and these um Really, what they also did was connect the, the the community within itself, because when a disaster strikes, people are really, you know, afraid and they, they feel really isolated. And um, I think um, what Casa Circulo Cultural and Peninsula can definitely um, be a part of is to to go and ask what the people need and really connect the communities um, because the communities have um, have some sort of knowledge of what their needs are and and um, and have have also knowledge of what to do with a disaster. We just have to really connect it um, through through better communication and um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Annalie. Okay. Um, who has not gone? Jeremy? Sure, hi. Uh, I'm Jeremy Shaw. I'm um, associated with PARCA. Uh, we work with people with uh, various developmental disabilities to live independently. Um, uh, in in the case of disasters, um, you know, this, the, these already marginalized populations become more marginalized still and uh and part of our goal is to try and work with uh you know our our people to uh figure out what their needs are what what resources they need uh to be able to access and to support them getting into it and so this is uh hopefully another way of of us reinforcing the that you know uh base to uh, to be able to have the the great community and integration that's necessary for getting through these kinds of events. Thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, Jessica. I see you're in from your phone. So if you can't report out yet, that's okay. Okay, so Jessica typed in the chat. Um, Jessica works at Nuestra Casa as a programs assistant and navigator. I help families apply for public benefits and provide resources. In this role during disasters, I'm able to provide families with information needed. I have also helped families apply for the PG&E reimbursements during the power outages currently in the CERT program to learn more of what I can do during disasters. Great, thank you, Jessica. Um, Caroline, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, hi, all. My name is Caroline. I am a program manager with Climate Resilient Communities, or CRC for short. Um, we work in East Palo Alto, the Bellhaven neighborhood of Menlo Park, and North Fair Oaks primarily uh, to empower frontline community voices to create climate change solutions. Um, and so I think in the disaster situation, um, we think a lot about how that relates to environmental change uh, and also to really work directly one on one with residents to provide information as quickly as possible um, and to just make sure that uh, information is spread widely and accurately. I think we saw in the first round of storms back in January that um, a lot of people didn't really get good information until um, it was a little bit too late. And then we were all on the back foot sort of scrambling, trying to figure out how to get information out as quickly as possible. Um, and so I think for us, we're always thinking about how can we do both that proactive planning, but then being ready to sort of spin on a dime and be ready to um, deploy those information and resources. Thanks, Caroline. And Bob? Bob Jay. Hi, my name is uh, um, Bob Jones. Uh, some people call me Robert, so I'll leave that up to you. Um, I uh, work for an organization. I wear two hats in the city of East Palo Alto. Uh, one is uh, the CERT area leader for a group called REPAC. The other one is I work, uh, I'm a 
a member of Faith Missionary Baptist Church. Um, and both those organizations uh, uh, kind of intertwine with each other. Uh, the REPAC uh, CERT group is something uh, or group that we formulated uh, in 2016. Uh, and we've been uh, operating and struggling trying to, trying to coordinate disaster preparedness within the city of East Palo Alto. Uh, and uh, the other uh, work, uh, being at Faith, I've been there for about 20 years. Uh, and we about mm, probably around 2013, um, I was asked by the pastor to start uh, look into disaster preparedness. Um, and what this is right after mm, the San Bruno fire uh, and what our church can actually do. And we have been uh, certified by the Red Cross as a volunteer intake center. Uh, if there's a major disaster happen and volunteers are needed, that we would act as a clearinghouse for that, uh, as well as we uh, will um, are able to, with the system from the county um, uh, um, uh, emergency management department, received a uh, ham operating system that could communicate uh, pretty much throughout the, the state of California and act, uh, will also act as a uh, centralized location where information from the community to those entities like the police and et cetera, uh, be able to transfer, uh, uh, communicate information about what's going on in the city. Um, and so that's pretty much what I do. Um, <laughs> Uh, within the city of East Palo Alto, and we don't, we are uh, in the process of trying to get our 501c3 uh, so that we can organize ourselves a little bit more. But in the meantime, we're purely as a volunteer organization, and we are we're currently working with uh, two of the organizations that's, that currently that's on this um, particular um, Zoom meeting, uh, and hopefully we can strengthen that relationship, coordinating services and, and processes. Thank you, Bob, for being here. And then I'm just going to throw it over to Petra or Kirsten if you want to do a short introduction. I don't think we need to do a big Thrive organization update, though. I think I may have covered that. Yeah, I just want to say hi and how happy we are to see so many people. And it's unfortunate that this is so timely, but it is very timely. And um, we're happy to be providing the service and uh, seeing so many of you in the room. So thank you all for being here. Okay, um, thank you for taking the time to do introductions. I know you know that takes time, but it's also really valuable to learn about each other's work and potentially what services you're offering in a disaster. And that's a really big mission of ours at Thrive Rise is to make sure we are aware of all of the resources and all of our potential partners in San Mateo County. So I think from here, we're gonna go ahead first into the content. Heather, if you wanna take it over. I can. Oh, someone's already moving a slide. I'm going to do a really fast, I'm looking at the time. I'm going to try and keep this to 10 minutes. I'm going to have Anna keep waving at me in the background going, so that I can do this. Um, but I want to give you guys a kind of quick and dirty, um, sometimes I call it a boot camp, um, about the incident command system. So can you go to the next slide, please, Kristen? Um, the incident command system, and I'm gonna immediately start calling it ICS, just so you know. Um, and I'm gonna work really hard to throw acronyms at you and forget to tell you what they mean. So always ask, um, there's a lot of people who have enough background, they might be able to just throw that in the chat for me. Um, if somebody doesn't know, uh, raise your hand or just interrupt me. Um, like every single thing that we do as humans, we give things names and then we immediately turn into acronyms and then we end up in our own little bubble. Um, this one is no different. So my this is my long story short about the incident command system. In 1970, there were fires that were so bad and so uncoordinated. Um, a whole bunch of people died and it was like a really bad comedy, you know, from bef you know, before talkies. Um, and so a bunch of people with even more acronyms that I'm not even going to tell you anything about got together and said, we need to do this better. So since 1970, this has been in that like continuous process improvement um, 
uh, sort of thing. You know, we do something then we get together and we say, okay, how did that go? And how can we do better next time? So there's a lot of experience and best practices involved in this. Um, I'll send you guys out later today um, a page that I call resources, and there'll be a link to a nice, you know, lo nice long read on someone's website about how all this started if you want to know more about it. Um, but at the at the end of the day, all you need to know is that this has been going on for a long time and I didn't just make it up and it's not, you know, it's not some copyrighted thing that belongs to some organization from a couple of years ago. I wasn't even born in 1970, so it's even older than me. Only by a little bit, though. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide and the next slide, these are the the underlying principles because what you really need to think about in your disaster response comes out of these underlying principles. How your organization, and thank you, I took copious notes um, about all of you and for taking that time. I like to know who I'm working with. And there are so many people who are so ready to, to learn this work and make their organization, make their organization's response uh, feel less chaotic. Um, I describe this all the time. That's that very first one, order from chaos. Just so you know, the things in the brackets are those words that we're all supposed to use the same. And then I am I have on the end kind of what I think that means. Because again, no one uses these outside of the FEMA training. Um, so as you all figured out, probably from something um, even bigger and more disruptive than the storms we had in January, um, because it's, it's, it's been, it's been a few interesting years, <laughs> just say that between all the fires and, uh, the pandemic, um, the various earthquakes we've had, um, to the North of us, to the South of us, um, we can all, we can all think about this, uh, a little bit better, um, some of those things that we that we want to do is we want to divide and conquer. Try not to have, you know, just one. Don't think that you're the only organization. Hopefully, just from listening to this, you know, you're not the only organization who's who is helping um, do resource matching or um, doing accurate information share. Uh, the great thing that the COAD can do is help make those resource shares broader so you feel less alone. Um, and get that information, yeah, that accurate information out faster and more consistently. Um, so again, and then don't duplicate. Um, one thing that we that we want to make sure we don't do, just kind of as an example, is that when we're looking at an area like North Fair Oaks, we don't put, I know it's not very big because I live nearby, but we don't have, you know, two places that are distributing um, food or sandbags or something and they're next door to each other. Like, let's let's think about it and, and spread it out and make it easier for people. Um, and part of that is, you know, that help a colleague out is making sure that um, even if we can't, if we can't do something, but we know, we know people that need help, we can, we can find somebody else, uh, we can support what they're doing, even if we can't do it ourselves. Um, I'm thinking about the, the art group. I have already flipped all those pages over for, for who is who, but the artist space that's just now pulling their, getting their, their space back together. And I have all my fingers and toes crossed that your roofer has done a great job and that there isn't going to be any more water this weekend in your space. Um, knowing who some of your other partners are, being able to move resources, um, move artists' materials. Um, it's just like kind of one of those examples. Um, the next slide. Um, kind of goes on the same sort of thing. Um, this thing of setting operational objectives. Um, it's really important to figure out what you can and can't do. And it's really important that all of this kind of sums up in that same way. Like what, what you can and can't do, what you can um, share with somebody else or get somebody else to take on for you. And that um, we describe, one of the ways we describe this in response work is knowing what done is. 
um, is your objective. It's it can be hard, especially when things come, you know, one after the other, like the, the rain has. When do we when do we stop responding? When are we doing recovery? Like there's a deadline right now for the the SBA loans, which I think is in mid March for San Mateo. I'm not sure. Um, this storm may cause a, like that happens this weekend may cause enough damage that information changes. So keeping track of those moving targets and making sure that we're all on the same page with them. Anna, we should have rescheduled. Just letting you know. Um, <laughs> can I get the next slide? Um, some of the things that using, see, here's some more of those acronyms. Um, the SEMS, S-E-M-S, or NIMS, N-I-M-S, is some other, the state of California, and then the FEMA level, this is their um, exact same thing, but it has a totally, you know, they have a totally different name for that managing, um, the management system that ICS is a part of. Um, but um, your organization, and this is something everybody is, it, it's a thing that exists, but that everybody is trying to really figure out. So I won't have really specific answers for you here for San Mateo County, but there is reimbursement funds that come about because of the declaration of a disaster that nonprofits even can have access if their county requests it for them. Again, this is something like if you want to see it work, go to New Jersey. New Jersey has figured all of this stuff out, um, which has to do with because they figured it out with Hurricane Sandy. Um, yeah. Rick is going to do a great job of catching all of my acronyms. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> um, um, part of coalescing into a co-ad will be helping the county figure out how you guys can support their reimbursement, how they can support your reimbursement. Um, another thing with ICS, um, with emergency is they'll we'll set up something called an emergency operations center. I think San Mateo calls theirs an EOC. Anna, do you know if they call it something? Okay. Um, again, this is one of those places where everybody calls it something slightly different. <laughs> um, and in terms of for nonprofits, the two things that that's the most important for us is um, that accurate information like, like collecting, you know, what is available, what are the road closures, where are the sandbags, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then the resources, tracking them, sharing them out. A lot of us had experience with this during COVID, you know, that thing where there was, there were tons of masks and then there were no masks and there were tons of masks and there were no masks. Um, the emergency operation at that time, when they would when they would get masks in, for example, they would be able to um, share out, you know, like through a, through a co-ed or a voed is really common, and say, hey, we've got a bunch of these these things that are you know that are in short supply, like masks. Can you use them and share them out? Um, the other thing, even outside of the emergency operations center, every once in a while, something will impact our communities that won't rise to the level of a disaster, um, but will still need us to be taking care of our community. And having something like a co-ed lets nonprofits coordinate and do that without having to involve the county, which for them, it didn't rise to that level. Um, next slide. Um, I just wanted to show you this. Um, this is the org chart of a very large incident. Um, I just want you to see that it scales for each organization. If you, you can't see this, so don't worry about it. That very top, um, bit, oh shoot, I forgot to add a small one. Um, I'll see if I can find one during the break. Um, there, it, there is an org chart for each organization, the organizations that come together like at an EOC 
they're going to have and use that same org chart. This is kind of that using the same terms, having the same the the same areas of responsibility, so that we can work with each other and know who we're talking to. Um, something big enough, there'll be one at the state, and they're having the same exact structure. And then something like Hurricane Sandy, there were 14 states who had this structure, and it goes all the way up, all the way down. So we'll talk about the specifics of these, I like to call them hats, or these areas of responsibility. Uh, you're using them in your nonprofits, but you're not calling them the same thing. And so the next section after we take a break um, here in a quick minute, um, we'll be kind of going through that process and letting you you know, talk through and imagine through and see how you are already doing these things. You're doing these things, you know, kind of in normal day to day, because this is just, you know, pro this is really just a type of program management. Um, but you're also doing this in a disaster. And so you can start to see how, how all of that fits together and how your response when something big comes up uh, can be, can, can feel less chaotic uh, than, than it often does the first time we encounter disaster. Uh, I'm almost done, I promise. Next slide. Um, these are just to let you know, you know, you will very unlikely to use these in your individual organization, but at the county level when an EOC, um, uh, when an EOC opens, they will be creating these things. Um, that are that are quite standard. The incident action plan or the situation report. Uh, if this is something that is that is being used by the county, um, and they determine that that information should be shared because they're really coordinating a good response with nonprofits. Some counties do, some counties don't. Um, they'll share these with you, and that would be the sort of thing that Anna would send out, like every day in an email, like here's what's going on today, you know, in the large picture. And then here's that summary of what happened yesterday. Uh, next slide. Um, other, another couple of other things, the tools in ICS that are really important is that contact roster, who's in charge of things, um, who's in charge uh, can change over time. And sometimes when we are doing disaster response, we're not doing the things that we normally do. We're, we're wearing a different hat than usual. And so having a place where people can see, oh, you're, you're usually in charge of the front desk, but right now you're in charge of, and I can't think of a single thing, but you're in charge of something else. So I know to go to you for that something else. Um, and then published meeting schedules um, are a really important part of getting on the same page and doing that thing that I call making order out of chaos. Um, set a daily, like set a daily meeting time that everybody can either call in or show up um, and have that conversation. Hey, this is what we're doing today. You know, this is the most important thing, the reminder to be safe. Um, having that at the same time every day, lets people schedule around, lets the people who call in know. Um, and it really creates that consistent feeling that we're all missing when we're busy responding to things and not doing our regular day-to-day -day stuff. And the last slide I have on this super fast 10 minute ICS bootcamp um, is something called Web EOC. And all this, I wanted you to hear the word because um, it's a really popular tool. And it is just an online version of all of those forms and that place where you gather information because, you know, we've all moved everything into an online tool instead of a piece of paper, you know. So, um, I suspect that at some point along the way, Anna will end up with a login to this. Um, it's kind of common that a co-ad will get a login to be able to access information and share there. Um, but I don't know that we're there yet in San Mateo. And that is my super fast, here are some principles um, in the background uh, that will inform the next part of our discussion. Um, but I wanna give us a break because um, we've been at this for um, a good hour. Um, what we're going to do for this next section, um, there's eight slides in this next section. And what these are, thank you, Kirsten. Um, 
what these are, I'm calling this section is how do we, and each one is going to be a question. I'm hoping that a lot of you will participate either in the chat um, or pop up and talk about in your organization. Each of these represents a particular role or hat or area of responsibility in doing like disaster management work. Um, but I want you all to think about how that's actually happening in your organization. Because again, it's 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 management skills. So we're all doing it. It's just some different ways to think about it and to think about it in terms of what I, like I said before, I'll say it over and over again, is bringing order from chaos. So let's move to the first slide, um, which is how our organization responds to disaster. Um, does anybody want to talk about who in their organization is the person who takes charge of that big picture? Like the person who says, hey, there's a big storm coming. I got to notice about it. What are we going to do? Um, <laughs> Petra, Anna, <laughs> that's Anna's job now for Thrive. That's awesome. Um, so Anna, do you want to take this first one for Thrive and for the um, for the co-ad and talk about how, kind of your process? Yeah, I can talk about... I can talk about what we did on New Year's Eve and what we were doing before that was really building the infrastructure for the co-ad and trying to build relationships. And a lot of that was in the hypothetical. It was like four disasters um, and it wasn't, it didn't feel um, as real to us necessarily because we were two months in and really just trying to do the building blocks. So that was my day-to-day -day job is the building blocks, right? And then on New Year's Eve, um, you know, I, I start getting on the phone with the Department of Emergency Management up through the night, right, and talking to HSA, and then it's like, oh, okay, I'm hearing things that make me think I need to completely change what, what we're doing, and I need staff for that, so I need other Thrive people to stop doing some of what their day-to-day -day jobs are and start helping me. <laughs> And we didn't, we didn't have a very clean process for that in place. And I'm saying that not to like, as a critique, but as um, this was a big learning experience for us of like, what will I need as our disaster person? If, if the amount of work that a flood response um, warrants is way beyond the capacity of an individual person. And so that's where you know, we really started improvising. Petra, can you go into the EOC too? Kirsten, can you help with this? Um, and it was really a, a coordinated group effort, but improvised. And what we would like to do is um, kind of institutionalize those roles a little bit more. Awesome. Yeah, and that's often what happens in any organization. Um, and it can be uh, because it's it's a it's a new it's something new or a new organization or um, it's it is a new idea that you would have a response role. Um, it can also just happen because we have staff turnover and it could be it's been a while since anything's any anything you know out of the ordinary has happened, and whoever it was that knew about that isn't with us anymore. Uh, we've had staff turnover. And so because it wasn't institutionalized in some way, um, everybody is now scrambling and trying to figure it out fresh, new, and, you know, what do we do this time? And so this, this whole thing is this idea of how do we institutionalize this? How do we capture that information? How do we make sure that every time isn't, you know, running around, you know, waving our hands in the air and trying to trying to imagine what could we do this time but how do we do this so that it's like oh because a lot except for earthquakes a lot of things we see coming like we see these storms coming and it's uh just kind of a kind of an amazing example in terms of disaster education <laughs> um to have had a storm response a couple of months ago and to be rolling into one so it's like this kind of horrible tight turnaround of that opportunity to say okay everybody probably hopefully is 
is still in our organization, we could sit down and, and actually take those lessons learned and turn them into what we're going to do this time. Um, I don't recommend it, but I also don't think that uh, climate change and the weather in general is going to make it such that um, we don't have to have that experience of tight turnarounds in our disaster responses anymore. Um, if you take some other classes with me, um, I have horrible slides of statistics of, you know, how how climate change perhaps, perhaps not, but how things we're having more, we're having more responses and they are more expensive and, and more complicated to respond to over time. Um, so next slide, because I want to make sure that we get through these. And I, if people don't, um, I call them Anna. I don't want to have to call on people because I will completely call on you randomly. Um, so hopefully somebody will want to talk about this. Um, one of the things is, is wondering how do we, how do we stay on the same page? How do we keep track of what's been done? How do we figure out what needs to be done? An incident command, this is called a planning chief or a planning person. I like to think of this as the best administrative assistant that you've got, that person who just, you know, takes the best meeting minutes, um, can can hear what it is that you mean and what you're saying, um, and turn that into action items. Um, so this isn't necessarily, what I'm talking about here isn't necessarily the, or it, not necessarily, let me rephrase that. What I'm talking about here isn't how we talk to clients. It's not our outward facing. It's not how we're getting information from Anna, from the county. It's how are we inside of our organization, organization keeping track of those lessons learned, um, turning the, you know, that turning the stuff into policy. Does anybody have an example of how they're doing that in their organization? If someone doesn't pop up, I'm going to call in somebody from the CID. CID is <laughs> here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We we heard our name being thrown, but I'll let whoever else wanted to speak first, then I'll hop on. Whoever that was. Was somebody else trying to speak? I think okay. it was Paul. I think, I, I think we should take it. Well, was it Paul? It. Oh my God. All right. Well, I'm just gonna um I'm just gonna say uh Paul is uh, pretty much uh the person that handles it for us. Um he's a program manager, but he's also a, an interim uh, executive director, um uh kind of co-existing in that with uh, with our finance manager. So between him and her, they handle everything. So he handles a lot of the, um, actually all the incoming uh, information. And uh, he's our lead contact with CFL, ILC and PG&E and everyone else. So he gets us engaged when we need to. And he reaches out for volunteers over the weekends because uh, we don't exactly work weekends, but we're open for overtime then. So uh, he, he he figures out the schedule for, for the disaster response. So that's all I wanted to say. And uh, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> yeah, and and that's the I, I guess you know to piggyback on what Anna has mentioned about the Thrive Response since the beginning of the year, um, we're still in this response building the building the ship as we're sailing it um, uh, model, and we have not yet gone to the post response analyzing what we did. How do we then you know to 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 the term that you you Heather and Anna. Um, is to institutionalize this effort, but ideally, you know, and, and that's what I'm hoping to learn, and we're uh, the CID team is hoping to learn from this COAD um, initiative and these trainings. Is ideally, we would like to then during those lulls, you know, like we know storm season is is upon us, you know, the this the, the next several months, but as things shift into the spring and we now move away from the wet weather season and then start to plan for the warm weather uh, season, there's that lull where we can start building a playbook, you know, like just an idea of building this. I mean, it's great. And we've been fortunate enough to have good team members, but there's also been team, um, team turnover and having sort of a playbook is, it would be kind of my immediate goal for this year is just let's get a playbook so that when in the ends is that, you know, you know, there is st staff transition, the next person in line uh, has that in front of them, pops it open. This is how communication works. This is how we disseminate information. This is when we disseminate the information. Anyway. Awesome. There are trainings upcoming that we'll talk about that and pass you along templates. Um, and then I have some other resources um, and people from independent living in East Bay that I want to make sure that you know 
Um, and would that be Mr. Ron Haylog? By it absolutely sense? would. He, uh, <laughs> it's a, uh, sorry, sorry, everyone, but I'm, I'm going to just keep uh, it brief. Keep aside, it brief. He is awesome. We're, we're waiting to get him in a, in our team and uh, to talk to our team because, uh, yeah, I've, I've worked with him in 2021 and 2020 and he's amazing. Okay, good. Wendy, your hand is up. Hi, I just want to comment. Um, yes, at least for our organization, Veronica Scames, who is the founder, she is the one that organizes everything. And we are some other people that are working there. So what we do is um, we see uh, and we decide who's doing what, who's responding the text message, who's doing the, you know, the uh, social media and everything. And normally what we also help us is do a, like a Google document that every can, you know, everybody can see and make sure they can put notes what they have done or what information we need to share. So some some other examples that we do in our organization. Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you. Way back when I threw a whole bunch of words and things at you and said, we'll kind of suss this out later. And it, you know, I call it a boot camp or you know, possibly a 10 minute scare. Um, what you're doing with that Google Doc, you're creating that incident action plan. That's, or, you know, it's kind of like, you know, on the web, so web EOC, but you're doing that documentation. You're creating that, that record that you can go back to and say, Hey, this is how we did this. Um, and, you know, use that as a template for next time. So that's absolutely perfect. And that's a, that's a great best practice. And then just, you know, grabbing that making sure that it doesn't get lost, um, so, so we're going to slide through next one. What is my next slide? Um, everybody's safe. I think somebody here had, was, was actually in charge of their organization's emergency plans or was an emergency manager. And I can, somebody can pop up or I can dig through all of my notes. Um, but if somebody wants to talk about how they keep track of things like the emergency plans or the response plans, um, you know, who talks to the fire department when they come through and do an inspection, like that sort of thing. That's, that's who your safety officer, or your emergency officer is in the usual, uh, Jeremy popped in director of programs tends to do this, um, but yes, it is in fact always an uphill battle to keep people's interest. One of the things that I do um, is I'll go to um, supportive housing um, uh, facilities like the SROs in San Francisco, and we'll do a personal preparedness with the staff and with the people who live there, and we'll do a fire drill. Um, people hate to do fire drills. Um, because, you know, those alarms will go off all the time and they're like, oh gosh, one more time. One way I've found to get people interested is I try to find that secondary route out of the building that they've never tried before. It's good to have that practice. It, it's something that can engage people's interest to do that. But unfortunately, disaster planning is one of those things that we really don't as humans. It's like, it's on the to-do list, but you know, it's down on the bottom of the to-do list. Like someday I need to go get my car cleaned. It's on the bottom of my to-do list um, until something happens, you know, until those storms happen in January and then suddenly it's thrust to the top of our to-do list. So one of the easiest ways to do this, and if you take some other classes from me, I'll go into more depth on it. Um, is how can you embed this into the every day? Like the more you can embed it into the every day, uh, the better. Um, some organizations will have like a special, you know, special app or they'll use a chat, um, you know, like the SMS um, feature on your phones to connect with each other. Um, really good ones that I've seen um, is before like monthly meetings, like all hands meetings, um, somebody will send something out on that particular Slack channel or in that particular chat group that says, you know, come to the meeting prepared with a joke or, you know, some particular thing so that you can tell when you get to the meeting who's actually participated in it and then it keeps it kind of alive in your phone. So 
Um, but it involves uh, a phenomenal amount of creativity to keep coming up with these things. One of the really great things about showing up to these kinds of classes is hearing how other people are doing things because it can spark an idea or give you, you know, some new some new way to make it interesting um, to the people that are that are in your group. Um, next slide. Um, assigning staff. Um, Wendy actually gave us a really good example of this, of just having that, because it's a fairly small team and just sitting down and saying, okay, this is what we're doing now that, you know, who's, who's doing what thing and like making that, uh, making those assignments and doing that. Does anybody else have an example in their organization of that assigning, assigning staff, particularly assigning staff to different roles than they usually do? Hi, this is Gabby. I can share a little. Thank you, Gabby. Please. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, United Way and, and 211 Bay Area covers six counties. So um, we each have different roles um, when it comes to disasters. And then depending on the county, we have the counties also split up. So some of you all work with Claire Marcuson. She's the 211 director. And then um, so in San Mateo County, she, she fits that role and then she can send resources over to me to make sure they're in the database. And then we also make sure that the call center is aware of any um, highlights, you know, to your resources, anything changing, evacuations. Um, in Santa Clara County, I actually attend the, um, you know, the OEM calls. So mm -hmm. um, I'm on there with the police and the EMS and uh, National Weather Service gives their report, uh, pg &E gives their report, and Valley Water gives their report. And then 2 and one we can share how many calls have been coming in for inclement weather shelters and, um, you know, um, mostly like the warming shelters, sandbags, um, uh, you know, like the pre-disaster and then during the disaster if there's an evacuation. So um, we kind of split the roles up between counties and also how the county chooses because, um, you know, some have been using 211 for a while, some are new to it, some still haven't adapted to it. <laughs> so it depends on the county. Yeah, I know, Claire. Um, yeah, and that I just have to say that was a perfect description back when I was talking about having those standing meetings. Um, Santa Clara OEM has that's a standing meeting. Everybody gets to come together and report out, and then everybody gets accurate information and um, gets to to do that share. And um, I don't know what time they do those. Um, I talk with uh, Marsha, who runs Cadre, um, and I know she's on those calls too. Um, I'm not sure how um, San Mateo does theirs. Like I said, I talk with people um, all over the Bay Area and Northern California, and everybody does things just a little bit differently. Um, and one of the things that the COAD that rise, you know, coming into existence and all of you being here um, and starting to form these relationships among yourselves gives weight to our nonprofit, our faith-based community in San Mateo County, and then helps the county work with all of us better to make sure that we're getting the information that we need. Um, I work with emergency managers and emergency managers from all over the place, all over the country. And I'm always surprised when I talk to them about our nonprofits and what our nonprofits are doing in terms of disaster response, how many of them, it's brand new information. Like, and some of these people have been doing their job for a long time. And they're like, really? Like, well, I knew about the Red Cross, but I didn't know about, you know, I didn't know that, you know, something like an art space would have a disaster response that they would be supporting their clients. And it, it's news to them. Um, so that's one of the really good things about coming together and putting that, you know, the weight of numbers behind it is it will help San Mateo as a whole, you know, on either side of the hill and, um, between the county, the nonprofits, the organizations that are hyper local, like Art Bias, or organizations that are more regional, like 211. 
it lets all of them come together and create better services, better information, um, and more order from chaos for all of our residents um, throughout the county. Um, and my next slide is, I'm doing so good on time. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> um, how do we pay for this stuff? Uh, sometimes it turns out, you know, sometimes we're we're doing, you know, kind of what we do regularly, and it's just it's just a it's just a adjustment, um, you know, in the hours that somebody's working. Um, but it's you know part of the regular pay. But somebody mentioned like overtime hours on the weekend. Um, I know that uh, from my friend Ron that you know independent living centers have been activated and continue to be activated for months from the, well, frankly, because it rains every single Saturday. I'm trying to finish a floor at my daughter's house. And every single Saturday we come together to try to do another step to finish this floor. And it's always raining. Um, and then we get these opp opportunities or chaos like this weekend where we know a huge atmospheric river is coming in. It's gonna be a ridiculous snow dump. Um, and, and, you know, more flooding opportunity to, you know, need more sandbags, the whole thing. So all of this stuff adds up these, these, this overtime that we have to do um, in order to make sure that our, our clients are receiving the services that they need. Um, we have funding that is, you know, donor informed funding, the the, that fun thing where they say, we want you to do just this thing with the money, but then we need to do something else. So, you know, how do we find the funding? How does our, you know, this is something that our finance team can sometimes get really separated from operations in this area, but we really need to come together. So does somebody want to talk about how, and I'll call on Paul again, because he already mentioned it before, but I'd like to be somebody else so that we have as many voices as possible. Um, and somebody want to talk about how their organization finds funds in order to um, do disaster response. I already know how the United Way does it too. So I can call on Gabby also if, if she doesn't, you know, she might know. <laughs> Jean. <laughs> um, I'll I'll just chime in. Um, and it, it's true, uh, the independent living centers, because of our funding from PG, have been activated. The one thing that's I guess limiting about that is that PG has very strict criteria. And so as consumers come to us, uh, there is a needs assessment and a qualifying um screening process. However, you know, again, as uh, some of the folks alluded to, like there's other folks that do who, who also get uh, impacted during these outages or or just uh, with the storms and and that's where it becomes limiting um a, like a good example would be for this upcoming event um some org uh, some uh, ILCs have been authorized to provide resources will CID still on standby and uh, just because of the, the forecasting and so we won't know until we'll be able to deploy these funds and so we have consumers now who are aware that, hey, we can go to CID, but our resources are are sort of tied up uh, based on approval and need. So, I mean, obviously there is still need for filling in the gaps, um, finding alternate means of funding uh, to ensure that, you know, our community and, and the people that we support are resilient and have a resource year round. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody else want to No one. We don't really know how we're paying for things, do we? <laughs> that that can sometimes be a problem. I know. Excuse me. Make that alarm stop. Um. Somewhere I have. I'm gonna stop looking. I I wrote down copious notes about all of you, and they have been lost in my my paper pile now. Um. So, um, I will. Um, yeah, checking my notes. Anna, we talked about this and I'm trying to remember now with my, I, I can just, my recovery brain here. 
Yeah. yeah no, my, my brain's a little mushy right <laughs> now too, but on this one, I did write in the chat. I found that in ter- we, I think we often look to private donors because generally government funding is slower to become released. Right. And that's even at the, even when counties make funds available, that can be slower, um, let alone FEMA or, S- or SBA. So um, I, I've noticed though that in terms of the organizational costs incurred, it's much harder to get that covered privately. Um, I think a lot, like for example, some of the foundations that stepped in in January um, were providing direct grants to the community. And I, as I said, it's like, that's how it should be. That's where a lot of the need is. But, but we do have to think about the organizational costs that are associated with disasters and, and how can we make this equitable to nonprofits that operate, you know, on a pretty, pretty slim margin sometimes, and then are asked to do some um, quite extraordinary work when um, where our communities are, are in need. And so that's a long-term question. That's not really an answer. Um, but, but I think I wanted to note, like, there are several things that are really long-term initiatives that we can do as non-government entities um, to streamline the reimbursement process for those that would be eligible to get reimbursed through the county if they could get an MOU in place. And that's something I want to explore through the co-ed over the next couple of years, because frankly, I don't, with few exceptions, like, I don't think this is an easy question to answer. Like you, the, the, the ways that we respond to disasters, which are so, so different, right? Each one, we have no idea sometimes what we're going to be doing or what kind of new programs we're going to have to, to launch in the moment to meet community needs and what the costs for staff time or materials or equipment will be. Um, And so I think my point is there's a need to explore this more. There's not really a a black and white answer here, but it's something we need to talk about. One thing that I know historically with um, foundations in particular, foundations tend to you know, they get topical. There's, there's what's interesting at the moment after hurricane Katrina, it became incredibly interesting to foundations to fund and support nonprofits in their work. And it's, it's been a while since we've had something like hurricane Katrina, I guess, or maybe they just got exhausted or bored with it, but it's not as topical or interesting anymore. Like I know, I know, I know the story of San Francisco, uh, foundation. Um, San Francisco Foundation has pivoted more towards climate climate justice as opposed to disaster response or, you know, um, recovery work. You know, climate change and the, you know, what's, is one of the causes of this, but it's not, you don't see it the same way. Sometimes it's about how do you word what you're doing to talk to those organizations. Um, that's one thing that I found is, is tying this back into tying, you know, reframing the language. And again, this is, you know, they've been at this for a long time. It, I, I work in my own little bubble of language, but reframing what we're doing in terms of like, this is about, you know, bringing equity. This is about responding, you know, creating justice around climate issues for whichever neighborhood, um, is one of the ways that you can, you know, I guess, you know, access access that money for this sort of thing. And a, a lot of it, it comes back to that documentation. Like when I said, like write stuff down as you're doing it, like a situation report, like, you know, put somewhere, like, what did we do every day? How many people did we serve? Having those statistics later, um, we, we all apply for funding. We all know. Um, if you make sure even during a disaster, you're collecting that information um, so that you can then package it up and explain that um, can be really helpful. Jennifer, your hands up. Yeah, I think I just wanted to also add because something that Jessica had brought up when she was introducing herself was on top of like disaster res- response, right, specifically, like, how can we help the community in the time of like, there's a flood, you know, but also to like what you mentioned about PG&E, right? Like our organization, specifically like Jessica, supports communities on getting benefits. And so a lot of time then also uh, we spend um, helping community members like getting reimbursements from PG&E, right? Um, 
you know, they, they come in, how can, uh, what can I do because of this? And even just navigating them to, to finding uh, other resources, other like, you know, letting them know about our food distribution, that there's food that you can, you can come get from our organization to replace food that you lost in between trying to get PG&E to like do reimbursements, right? So I think that also takes up a lot of time from organization. And I'm just interested to hear if anybody else has find ways to, um, you know, get support on funding to cover the, that additional burden that gets put onto smaller CBOs. I think the silence is telling. <laughs> the silence is very telling. Um, Anna mentioned this, and I know that two one one does this. Um, um, one of the one of those one of those ways is um, particularly if you're providing a service that the county is relying on. And I'll be honest, in disaster, the work that we do, the county is relying on it, and sometimes they just don't know that they are. Um, so again, that's, you know, one of the things that this group can do is put weight behind that, like, see, this is what we're doing. This is how we're supporting, you know, your goal of, you know, putting things to right for people and making sure that they receive those resources. And so getting a MOU in place, um, MOU is a memorandum of understanding. It doesn't mean that you're absolutely going to, to work together in a disaster, but it set some of those parameters of if you do work together. I'm saying disaster because that's what I do all day and MOU works for, you know, any kind of thing. We might work together on something and you can do things like lay out how you would get paid for that extra work that you do. Um, or, you know, who takes care of damages or, you know, what are the things that you can or can't provide? Uh, thank you for the thumbs up, Gabby. Um, getting those in place and keeping those things active, like it takes extra time and effort. Um, and I happen to know for so many of us in our organizations, because like this stuff is other duties as assigned, because this work isn't in our main mission statement. So, you know, it's like adjacent, mission adjacent. That's why I describe my work. I help people with mission adjacent. Um, so, whatever, whatever way we can, you know, and talk with your board about this, you know, get some of this that you do do disaster response, get this crept into like your mission statement and what you're doing, because you get it in your mission statement, you get your board thinking about it, then it can start to be seen in your budget. Um, if the board doesn't, if, if you don't make sure that they understand this is, you know, Hey, you know, it's we're we're halfway through March and 40% of the work that we have accomplished since January 1st has been in disaster response and focusing on that and we need to make sure that this work is funded that this work is, you know, is it showing that this is what we do. Um that's just one of those ways. Um if it exists there, then our our fundraisers and our crowdsourcing <laughs> Um, can reflect that, you know, we make sure that it gets into our annual reports. Um, Gabby mentions that there's 211 has an MOU. Um, thank you for telling me I explained that perfectly. My, I was sick over the weekend. We discussed on Monday if I needed, we needed to reschedule this and decided to go ahead. So thank you all who were planning to be in person for switching to Zoom um, so that I didn't share uh, my germs with you. Um, so I appreciate that I'm I am I am being somewhat clear because I feel really foggy in my head today with how I'm trying to explain things. Um, I have a couple of more slides um, and five minutes on five, my five extra minutes here. So let's scoot on a little bit. This is how this is um, it's fancy it's fancy uh, ICS title is public information officer. Um, if you are the person who makes sure that um, you're meeting the language access needs, things are getting translated into the four different languages, um, that your organization, you know, serves people who speak those four different languages and that that information is accurate for all of them, um, bless you. It's actually really hard work. 
um, to do this um, communication stuff, making sure that it's, you know, especially disaster information, it needs to really be, you know, like smart. It needs to be, you know, something that's actionable. It needs to be timely. It needs to be, you know, brief. Um, it can be really hard to know what it is that we should or shouldn't be sharing with clients because there's a whole lot of information coming at us and it's changing all the time. Um, and we don't, you know, it's, it's hard to look at it and say, okay, it's information. I can't do anything about it, but what if, what if people need to know it? Um, people make whole careers out of this. You can get whole degrees in this topic. Um, the thing that I suggest is any information, like even like the structure of it, if you can prep that, like if you can say, okay, a text needs to have this much information in it and you can have that structure. So you're just plugging in the, you know, the nouns, so to speak, um, that can, that can be really useful, especially if there's a lot, like I said, a lot of, of moving parts and various information going out. Um, I get information from, like I said, I work in the 12 counties of the Bay Area. And so I get information overload all the time when things happen. I can no longer remember which county is doing what in terms of floods. <laughs> um, so Anna says that they use HubSpot and have templates. So yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, yes. And I'm going to let Anna talk about the translation hub and do a little. Uh, a PSA for that and how it can be useful for this. It's uh, it's an amazing service. And I don't know of any other nonprofit alliances that are doing this right now. Yeah, Thrive has, um, is, it was either late last year or early this year that it, we launched the Translation Hub, which is basically any nonprofit can request, Kirsten, please tell me if I'm saying something wrong about this. <laughs> and on, on, like basically we provide translation services for free to nonprofits that request it. And we, we started with a pretty small menu of languages, Spanish and Tagalog, I believe. Um, but with all of that has happened since the beginning of the year, there's been more improvisation and we've added languages. We've gotten on-call Mandarin translators. We were in contact with ASL interpreters at the Disaster Recovery Center. And it's really, we've just kind of added things ad hoc, um, depending on what we're hearing from community-based organizations or residents about language need. So it's kind of funny because the service was really meant for other nonprofits, but I've used it a lot over the past, you know, two months for all of our um, co-ad related communications. And so we basically just, we get, we typically get vetted information from someone at the county. Um, and then we will put it into like this, this HubSpot email that's ready to go. And some of you might have something similar for like, okay, this is our template for a Facebook post or Instagram or a text message. And you just plug it in and shoot it out. And it's just to streamline the process. So that's been our approach to emergency communications. Yeah. The fact that you put create those translations and then send that information out already translated. Um, if no, one, well, I don't want anyone on the call to say thank you. You can do a thumbs up on it because um, I want to go to the next slide because I'm running out of time here. Um, but that's amazingly helpful. And that means that that translation too is consistent because we all translate things a little bit different and then we all read it a little bit different. Um, but lots of organizations have been having to receive that information and then take the time to translate it so that they can send it out. So it's really wonderful thing that you're doing. Um, I know a couple of other co-ads um, that do this and it's really becoming a best practice is just to make sure that's done in advance. So just it just speeds up that, that information movement. Um, we're gonna go over this really one super quick. Um, this is, in terms of ICS, this person is called the logistics chief. Um, I'll be honest, we're going on this really quick because I want to make sure it's here because that's what I do is logistics. Not all of our organizations do something so big that we would call it logistics. Um, but there's going to be somebody who is locating stuff like in, in 
like for Gabby with 211, their stuff is actually resource referrals. It's information is their stuff. But somebody's got to find that and keep it up and be available to go looking for it when a need comes in. So um, knowing that, you know, the food bank's looking, you know, for food and um, every one of you will have a, a different resource thing. Um, um, but just making sure when you're thinking about this in terms of hats, that somebody's doing that. I mean, we all figured out during COVID, we didn't, a lot of us didn't think we had supply chains or supply chain issues. Um, but, you know, I'm just going to say toilet paper and leave it there. <laughs> uh, we all we all discovered something about supply chains and supply chain issues. Um, and if you can think about that in advance, um, that can be fairly high level for some of our organizations or it can be um, you know, the first thing that we start, like the food bank, that's the first place that they start. Um, some other places, um, it won't be the first place that they start. Um, and then I have one last slide, um, and then we're going to take a quick break after that, um, which is for Anna. And Anna has done a really great job through all of this already talking about how, um, how RISE is connecting with the EOC and connecting with nonprofits and sharing that. I'm gonna, if you wanna talk some more, you can, but otherwise I'm gonna leave it at when we started and you talked about that learning curve that you have, I thought that kind of summed that up really well. Um, Cause again, I wanna take a break, but I also don't wanna cut you off if you wanna talk some more. We, we, can, we can just go ahead to the break. I'm happy to talk more about the co-ed specifically with people on an individual basis. Or just we can stay on afterwards. Yeah, whatever it works. Yeah. So I want to give everybody another like five minute break. Um, and then I want us to break into breakout rooms. Um, I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'll just have Kirsten. We'll, we'll end up in a little chat thing or we'll just talk and you guys and all have to listen to us. Um, but it will break you out into probably three breakout rooms. Um, I'll just let it be random because I want you guys to have an opportunity to, to really, you know, work with each other, you know, lean on each other's best practices and, and information share um, and kind of digest a little bit this in terms of, you know, what did you, what did you guys do? Um, with the storm response before and like what are you you know are you learning anything from what you did before in and in, in terms of how you're going into this weekend and so we'll go into some breakout rooms um, in about five minutes um, and let you guys talk about it and then we'll come back so it, um, but I want to give us about five minutes if anybody has um, like a really great practice um, or a wonderful thing that they heard that they want to make sure the whole group hears and I will say one thing that I have heard and seen is everybody sharing each other's information. So we'll make sure that everybody has, you know, everybody else's information from this call um, in case you didn't catch it on that, the last chat that broke out or something. So I'll give, you've got a couple of minutes um, for this. Would appreciate that sharing of, of everyone's information. That'd be great, Heather, thank you. I was encouraged by uh, the 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 simple share of uh, reach out to two one one. Although although there was uh, a little bit of a question as to uh, in in disasters how reachable they would be uh, and and what other recourse people would have for for dealing with that. Yeah, there's always that question if it's big enough and if we lose our if we lose the phones, um, what do we do? anybody else learn something good from one of their uh, colleagues here today that they're going to maybe implement? Well, we had a good discussion about uh, sharing resources in our group. Uh, we're all local to uh, North Fair Oaks, and uh, it's great to make these connections because in an emergency, that's that's so key as to, to have the network and communication. So uh, that was great. Oh, 
Paul, can I talk about what you said just to pick on you for the end of time today? <laughs> um, I I just really liked this idea about um, the place a nonprofit, the role a nonprofit plays, and this like balance between providing direct services to the community in blue skies versus not being able to be a first responder when their conditions are really bad and having to pull back or make some decisions on like how do we coordinate resources for a client without putting our staff in danger and so part of that is you know like yes coordinating staff roles and part of that should go in an emergency plan <laughs> probably but that that was just a really interesting um, subject that Paul brought up yeah and I was uh I was going to share with the team that, you know, we encountered like a sticky situation, but it's one of those in an, emer it's in an emergency, an organization like CID can respond directly. But if that, yeah, we turn into that blue sky, then we've identified individuals who, hey, we can now set you up with a individualized emergency plan. Let's talk about preparation. But obviously you can't do that as people come in during the storm situation. So yeah, like, you know, we now have a list of individuals who, once we're past this response phase of, of, of these storms, we can then go back to them and then start having conversations about, oh, yeah, remember that time you called us and it was a struggle to, like, get resources to you? Let's make sure this doesn't happen to you again. You know, how can we help you, you know, connect with neighbors or uh, other community resources? Well, to whatever Paul just said, I'll just say ditto, because he basically said everything <laughs> <laughs> and more to what I would have uh, probably said. So ditto, Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Gabby. Well, we're not going to go back to the slides. Um, I will send the slides out to you all this afternoon. Um, so for any way that they can be helpful for you, um, one of those slides uh, towards the end is going to have a couple of links um, for signing up for some more, um, a couple of the, the trainings for Thrive. We're going to fund through, you know, uh, through my funder with UWASI. And so there's links to sign up. So you'll be on my Zoom call instead of her Zoom call, but it won't make any difference um, at your end. Um, and um, I do want, before you all run away, I'm going to send you this link now in the chat. I will send this link out this afternoon. This goes to a little Google form. It is the evaluation um, that my government funding says I need to fill out. So I take no responsibility for the uh, one to five uh, scale. I'm not actually interested in the one to five scale. You can put all fives or whatever. I'm really interested in, in you know, what did you like about this? What could be improved about this? What other things would you like to learn um, or know about? What other classes um, and other teaching and you know collaborating opportunities can I um, help facilitate uh, for all of you? Like that's what I most want to know um, in that. But again, the more evaluations I get, um, it helps my funder um, see that this is really useful. Um, people are getting something out of it. Um, we want them to fund this, you know, year over year, because in that same way, it's hard to get um, organizations um, disaster funding. It's hard to get organizations disaster training. Lots of people want to do, you know, direct client services, one-on-one -on -one preparedness training. Um, these kind of classes have been really hard to, to find funding for. Um, so I sent that. You can do that. Anna, do you have anything else you want to add um, at the end of this session? Um, just in terms of the incoming storms, I'm in a windowless office right now, so I have no idea if the rains have started significantly, but uh, we plan to be, you know, really on call active over this weekend. If you hear of any particular community need that is unmet, email me. I'll put that in the chat right now. Um, we can always push things up to the county. And if we are hearing any information that goes beyond what you can find on the Weather Channel, we will start to push that out through the Coed Network. Um, so I would, I'm assuming that most of you are are um, already registered with our mailing list. If not, I'm furiously trying to find the link because I know we all want to get going. 
Um, but please just sign up for the COAD newsletter so that you receive um, any information we end up putting out this weekend. Um, and, you know, fingers crossed, we don't have to. But this is the link to sign up for the COAD newsletter. You just check the one that says community organizations, active and disaster, and then you will be on my mailing list. Okay. Um, everyone, please stay safe. Thank you for all the work you do. Thank you for coming today during this stormy day. <laughs> <laughs>